Welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk, this Monday edition. Brian Fisher is my name. Program is Focal Point, 888-589-8840. One more sound bite, then we're going to go right to the phones. This is the third excerpt from President Obama's uh, interview with Bill O'Reilly last night. And remember that President Obama, five days before his inauguration, or five days before the election, rather, said, we are on the cusp of fundamentally transforming America. He said that, huge speech, a lot of people there to hear it, big applause, and he said it to the entire world. We are about to fundamentally transform America. And, of course, we know what he meant by that. It transform it into a socialist utopian vision that he has, the involuntary redistribution of wealth, basically a fascist economy, and I mean that in a technical sense, not a pejorative sense. Fascism is where the government lets you own your own business, but then they tell you how to run it. That's fascism. That's what we have, those thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of regulation. That's fascism because that's the government saying, okay, you can own your business, but we are going to tell you in detail how to run it, tell you what you can and cannot do. That is fascism. So socialism is the involuntary transfer of wealth, and President Obama wants to do that, take from the producers, give it to the non-producers, and run a fascist economy. So Bill O'Reilly asks him this question based on a letter he got from a viewer. I got a letter from Kathy LeMaster, Fresno, California. I said I would read one letter for the folks, all right? Mr. President, why do you feel it's necessary to fundamentally transform the nation that has afforded you so much opportunity and success? I don't think we have to fundamentally transform the nation. Those are your words. And that's the important thing to me. It didn't even matter what because he, he just bloviated after that. But Bill O'Reilly called him out on it. Said, "Look, those are your words. I'm not putting words in your mouth. You were the one that used the phrase to fundamentally transform." Uh, all right, let us go to the phones and take some calls. Let me get my caller screener software up and running here. Just lost the link to the server. So let's go to Matt. Let's start with Matt in Grand Rapids. Matt, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Hey, Brian. Hey. Um, you brought up the fact that why conservatives aren't really standing up and doing a whole lot. And I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is a pretty conservative area. And I'm telling you, it's like a pressure cooker. These people are are pushing more pressure and pushing more pressure. And they play dirty. Um, we live a life on principle and a foundation. And these, I mean, how, how often do you hear us suing gay people that they'll try to sue um, a guy who stands up for the law? They just play dirty. And, you know, we live our lives, a conservative lives his life with freedom, and he, and he pulls his own weight, and he knows that he's got a place in the community, and he builds the community, and he takes ownership. And, you know, so we live our lives, we got, we got responsibilities and everything else, and they want to just play dirty and try to ruin our lives. Well, it's going to, you know, like I said, the, the pressure cooker is getting to a point. Mm-hmm. And if it goes too much further, you're going to see an uprival, I believe. I mean, around here, the whole gay thing, you know, it's, it's just getting to a point where we're sick of hearing about it. We don't think two guys being together and, and doing the deed they do, we think it's disgusting. And, you know, it's it's just going to get to a point where they will stand up, and it's going to be a huge, huge effort. It, but they play dirty, and, and until mm-hmm. until it gets to a certain point, I think conservatives are just going to get more and more pressure. That's all I can think of. Yeah, Matt, and, you know, and, and I agree with you there, and that's why I'm, uh, I'm urgent in this appeal to the nation's governors because this is the last... This is the last hope we have to avoid what you're talking about because I understand what you're saying, Matt. I hear it in callers every day. I see it and what I read as I do show prep that there are a lot of American people that have just about had it. I mean, they are right up to the edge of what they can take, what they are willing to tolerate, and we do not want violence. We do not want anarchy. We do not want chaos. We do not want vigilante justice. We do not want Americans taking matters into their own hands. We want these issues to be settled by our elected representatives. That's how the founders did it. They gathered in Congress assembled everyone that was a delegate to the 
Continental Congress in 1774 was elected, chosen to represent people back in their home colonies. That's what we want. We want people that we've elected, that we have chosen, that we have placed in office to make these decisions on our behalf. Right now, we can't count on Washington to do it. So we've got to count on the governors and the state legislatures to do it. Because I'm telling you, Matt, I'm, I agree with you. If they don't do it, if the governors and the state legislatures don't stand up to the tyranny of the federal government, we are going to have bloodshed. In fact, let me just read you a paragraph from my column this morning, Matt. It's up at rightlyconcerned.com. I skipped over this in my monologue. But here's an excerpt from my column this morning. The alternative, frankly, well, I go back to uh, Barack Obama talking about this new American revolution I'm calling for led by governors. This new American revolution would be orderly and peaceful unless President Obama were to send out Bull Connor with his fire hoses and his dogs to grind Americans under his heel. And it would be a revolution as it was in 1776 and should be today led by the elected representatives of the American people. The alternative, frankly, and this is what you're talking about, Matt, the alternative, frankly, is bloodshed and anarchy. Our economy has been shredded by taxation and regulation. Our culture is plunging into a moral abyss. Federal welfare is destroying the American family, and our education system is pathetically inept. The patience of the American people with government tyranny is nearly exhausted, and we are closer than most people think to something nobody wants, a thermal runaway of violence, civil unrest, and vigilante justice. Our governors represent our last best hope of avoiding what, in effect, would be another civil war. All right, Matt, listen, I appreciate the call. Thank you for that. And, you know, talk about playing by the rules. I was thinking about it this morning. You know, where did President Obama get this, th this, uh, th this conviction that ignoring the Constitution and the law is okay? Well, I'll tell you where I think he, he got it. I think he got it from the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court for the last 60 years since 1962, before that actually, but that's when it really got bad. The Supreme Court has been ignoring the plain meaning of the Constitution for six decades. They've been ignoring the plain meaning of the law for six decades, and they've been getting away with it. Barack Obama looks at that and says, hey, they ignore the Constitution anytime they want. They ignore the law anytime they want, and they get away with it. Nobody's stopping them. Nobody's doing anything to, to, to prevent them from doing it again, so there isn't any reason why I can't do the same thing that I see the Supreme Court doing. So, you know, we've got, we've got two of the three branches of government now are, are out of control, and the third one, Congress, is powerless to stop it or doesn't want to or won't. All right, let's go to Bobby, San Antonio, Texas. Bobby, welcome. What's on your mind? Oh, I, I, I'm just cruising here. I'm going home. Uh, I heard a statement about uh, children under the state, direction of the state. Yeah, yeah, that's the philosophy of liberals, that uh, children do not belong to their parents they belong to the state. How 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 does that happen, man? You know, I I can't believe that. And also, uh, I, I get tired of of uh, everybody, radio hosts, O'Reilly, Hannity, and everything else, uh, feeding the fire. Um, and. To me, that doesn't make no sense. No one has done it. They, they Okay, it. so so I want to get this straight, Bobby. You are disagreeing with my statement that uh, that liberals think that children do not belong to their parents but to the state. Right. Okay, well, right. let me let me replay you the soundbite. Let's go back. Uh, Jeff, clip A6. This is Paul Revere, former Secretary of Education for Massachusetts and a supporter of Common Core. And listen to what he has to say, Bobby. Is I'm 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 not putting words in his mouth. I'm just quoting him. Let's listen. Oh, okay. Again, the argument about where it came from, um, I think, uh, privileges certain sort of fringe voices about federalism and states' rights and things of that nature. When really, um, what we're doing at the national level here now, state by state, is what a lot of our states thought made sense individually. Why should some towns or cities in states have no standards or low standards and others have extremely high standards when the children belong to all of us. And well, right move. there, that's all we need. Okay. What was the last thing there, Bobby? When the children belong to all yeah, of us. No, what, what, oh, hold it, Bobby. What, Bobby, hang on a second. 
What about that phrase, Bobby? What word in there do you not understand when the children belong to all of us? No, it, 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 it's, a matter, it's a matter of money. Do you dispute the fact that there is poor districts and rich well, districts? Wait, wait, hold it, Bobby. I'm, I'm asking you, well, the question is, who do the children belong to? you got a guy oh, that sure. used to be the Secretary of Education for Massachusetts. Yeah, he said the children belong to all of us. doesn't have anything to do with money. He says the children belong to us. What about that do you not get? The children, the children belong to God, and secondly to the. Whoa, 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 whoa! That's not what he said, Bobby. Okay. He didn't say. He didn't say. He l listen, Bobby. He did not say the children belong to God first, then they belong to their parents, and then we educate them. He didn't say that. He said the children belong to all of us. What about that? Don't you get? <laughs> it's it's a it's a dumb statement. Okay. Well, okay, so it's dumb, but he said it, yeah. and he means okay, it. Okay, but he's, he's a former former somebody who really doesn't have any power. <laughs> well, but, Bobby, that's not the issue. We're not talking here about whether he has power. We're talking about whether he's representing a liberal view of children, and he is. He's supporting Common Core, and he said, Bobby, those are his words, not mine. The children belong to to us, not to their parents, not to God. The children belong uh, to us. All right, so uh, I take it you disagree with them, but you can't argue with the fact that he said it. Okay, I can't argue with the fact that he said it. All right, okay, Bobby, I think we're out of time up against the end of the uh, end of the first hour here. You know, and again, it's like I said, it's just what Melissa Harris Perry said. We've got to get over this antiquated notion that children belong uh, to their parents. They belong to the village. They belong to the state. And uh, that's a fundamental difference between a liberal worldview and a conservative worldview. We believe that uh, children rightly are under the authority of their parents, and the parents are the ones that have the responsibility and authority to direct their education, not the state. Hope point AFR Talk.